Thank you everybody for joining us. Um, we are back on Saturday with uh, Josh Dixon for another event on psychology. And today, Josh is joined by a special guest, Shoshana Melgram Knapp, who will discuss uh, with Josh the connection between literature and psychology. The title of this event is A Window to the Soul. Um, Josh Dixon uh, is an addiction counselor, addictions counselor, trauma therapist, and positive psychologist. He is the founder and clinical director of Resurface. Uh, Shoshana Milgram Knapp is an associate professor of English at Virginia Tech. Uh, she holds a PhD uh, uh, in comparative literature from Stanford. Uh, she has lectured about Ayn Rand's philosophy uh, around the world. So please uh, welcome our two speakers. And Josh, uh, you will, we will begin with you. Okay. Thanks very much and delighted to have you here, Shoshana, and lovely to see you as well there, Lee. Just as, just, I spoke to Razi about, you know, five, ten minutes ago, and I said to Razi, one, one of my problems is I don't read enough novels. Um, I haven't, uh, you know, th this is the sort of book that I read now, um, which is a bit like a novel, but it's, uh, you know, it, it's definitely, I, I like reading about heroes, but I'm reading about real heroes right now, as in real life heroes. But you know, what I wanted to talk about today from where I'm coming from is that certain novels have had, and certain characters in novels have had very profound effects on my psychology. And in the context of the work that I do, um, particularly when I'm working with people who are deeply traumatized, we find that we're always looking for, before we do any what we call trauma confrontation work, we're always looking for significant resources that people can use and draw upon to help um, balance them, to give them strength, courage, etc. And nearly everyone that I work with will come up with a, you know, the, the sort of standard real life resources that people will come up with. A sort of, you know, you always get a sort of, um, a Nelson Mandela, that he comes up a lot. Surprisingly, uh, surprising, it's surprising how often Margaret Thatcher comes up. Um, I, I'm, um, as you know, as, as a strong woman, when people are trying to work through uh, or, or be inspired by someone. And, but also, I get a lot of people will, will draw upon certain characters from novels, usually from that sort of those sort of formative early teenage years. So nowadays I get a lot of people um, who will draw upon characters from Harry Potter. I, uh, I've, I don't know any of these characters from Harry Potter. I've not read Harry Potter, but from, from what I hear, I, I hear they're good books. I hear they're good children's books and I hear that there's, you know, good characters in there. But what I usually find as well, and this is what I was saying a little bit earlier, is that clients will often have someone who's made a deep impact on them from reading novels when they were younger. And they, they often describe someone who is a heroine or a hero to them. And I know from my own experience in life how powerful that has been for me because the, the book that has had the most profound effect on me in my life in terms of heroes and psychology in, in fiction um, has to be The Fountainhead. And I read The Fountainhead when I was about 15. And there's something about that age as well when you first start to really um, connect with romantic characters, epic stories. Um, this, I found the same with a lot of the music I was listening to. But I found that, the, and I've, I reread The Fountainhead last year, and, and, I, and when I do my talks, for, um, when I talk to a lot of people about, you know, what would be a good start in psychology to start reading, you know, people say, can you recommend certain books, etc., on, you know, positive psychology or trauma recovery or so on. And I'll nearly always put the, the Fountainhead in there as, as probably one of the most profoundly psychological books I've ever read. And when I reread it last summer, I was uh, amazed by just the sheer range of um, characters and how well they reflected sort of 
certain types of psychology that people have out in the real world. And um, I was absolutely amazed. And I was amazed by how much I laughed and how funny I found a lot of that as well. So I find just from my own experience and from experience of all my clients that what, what characters in novels can do is they can represent a certain kind of virtue or a certain type of character. You know, in, in, in positive psychology, we talk a lot about character strengths and it's often a, 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 a character can, 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 people can hold a character in mind and use that as a resource. And something else that I've found, you know, deeply powerful about the Fountainhead is it brilliantly concretizes a certain kind of um, psychological behavior that we talk about a lot in addictions counseling, which is codependence. So in the Fountainhead, uh, Ayn Rand talks about the second hander, but in, and in, uh, and I'll often point towards a Peter Keating and, and that sort of ilk as the perfect representation of what we mean by codependence in, in, uh, in, the, in, the, in a lot of the clinical work we do. And codependence is, is, um, defined as having two major sort of traits. The codependent has two major traits. One is what we call self-denial. And the second is compulsive caretaking of other people. And it's driven by um, altruism. And interestingly enough, in a sort of general out, you know, society at large, this kind of behavior and this kind of uh, philosophy is exemplified and is, is considered the norm and, and what, what we should be um, reaching for. Yet, in the work that I'm doing in, within sort of a lot of clinical psychology, it's considered, when it's called codependence, a mental illness. And I just find that quite, I found that uh, quite interesting to observe recently, that, that uh, people who are displaying these traits of codependence are considered very sick. Yet, out there in the, the wider world, they're considered, this is considered virtuous behavior. For example, I'll give you an example just to, put this across um if about 10 years ago i think it was there's there's a newspaper in london that was given out for free called the evening standard and the evening standard um has like a hero of the i can't remember exactly what it's called but like sort of the hero of the year type person and usually goes towards someone in the public sector policeman etc and one year a nurse won it and she won it for um she was working 80 hours a week and this was considered virtuous. She was incredible. She was tagged in, uh, in, um, in sort of amongst some of my peers at work as being a compulsive helper, which is a type of, um, codependent and considered actually incredibly dangerous. If you think about it, someone working 80 hours a week with clients would be considered incredibly dangerous. Yet this person, exemplified out you know the sort of altruistic spirit yet amongst my peers just as considered sick because this is incredibly dangerous mindset to have and i found actually that the best way one of the best ways of of exp a lot of people really struggle to grasp to grasp and this kind of um behavior and mindset so I'll often point people towards the characters in the Fountainhead is actually a more condensed and stylized and, and to the point version of what people are actually trying to grasp in real life. I find that easier and I find that clients grasp onto that more easily than they do in real examples in life. So I, I found as, as a, you know, I keep repeating that this particularly, you know, the way that Ayn Rand concretizes people so well as fantastic resources to help myself and clients explain and show things. One other book that I wanted to just mention, and then I'll, I'll, I'll hand over to Shoshana here, but that had a real profound effect on me and is one of the most uh, psychological novels I've ever read. Uh, but it's pretty dark. 
um, and it's not enjoyable and there's no sort of lightheartedness was cr crime and punishment. And I remember reading that and I remember thinking that there, that this was the most extraordinary depiction of, of how someone would become a killer and the type of thinking that would be needed to justify it and uh, that would lead to that kind of behavior and to what happens. And I remember, I don't remember a huge amount of details. It's not a book that I've ever really wanted to reread. But uh, I do remember that also there was one character in it that I found inspiring and heroic, but he, he only had a very, a real bit part and that was the police officer in it. And I remember finding that uh, very moving and inspiring at the time. Um, so in my experience, in my work, to sum up, I found that the, psycholog the psychology of characters in novels particularly Ayn Rand's novels, particularly in The Fountainhead, have been um, extraordinary resources for myself and extraordinary tools in explaining and showing and concretizing types of behavior and types of mental illness and types of um, behavior driven by philosophy. And that's really what I wanted to get across today is, is, is really the power of, of characters in novels and how they can be used both as, as resources and as examples of types of uh, behavior. And I just want to pass over to Shana now. First off, I, I did want to correct something that Rosie said. You said I've lectured about Ayn Rand's philosophy and actually it's her literature. Um, on the other hand, when you're looking at Ayn Rand, she called herself a philosopher novelist and those with a hyphen, and those two things do go together. She saw her philosophy and her fiction writing as being related. And I think maybe that's one reason why, Josh, for you, some of her fiction seems to be especially uh, powerful and interesting and useful to you because without having to have a lecture on philosophy, you can see what some of her ideas and her system of ideas would mean in the lives of human beings. Uh, in, you know, from the Fountainhead, Atlas Shrugged, and so on. I think also what you said about how uh, it's inspiring for people to have heroes to look at. Well, in real life, heroes sometimes have, are described as having feet of clay, or they're mixed, or, I mean, you've got that Steve Jobs book in front of you. What, what else do I have to say about that? But um, in, in, in fiction, what's most important, especially if you're dealing with a writer who celebrates certain qualities, you have more clearly than you could see in real life or with the naked eye, the qualities of that person that contribute to the person's heroic behavior. So I think that that works. And actually, I had thought of sharing with us uh, one of my favorite passages from a psychologist, William James, about the nature of the hero. And oh, maybe I'll read that to you. I was thinking of doing it at the end, but um, I, I think since you just talked about it, it uh, he talks about, you know, James in our Principles of Psychology talks about the achievement of the will is holding on to something difficult and not letting it slip away. And he says that the hero can do that. And the, the rest of us, when we see something difficult, we lose our hold, we look away. But the heroic mind, I'm quoting now, acts differently. To it too, the objects are sinister and dreadful that can face them if necessary without for that losing its hold upon the rest of life. The effort which he's able to put forth to hold himself erect and keep his heart unshaken is the direct measure of his worth and function in the game of life. You know, it's a wonderful passage. And, when, and if you're reading about someone like that in fiction, you see that mental process of holding on to what's important even when it's difficult to hold on to it and everything that follows from that. And again, this is James, we draw new life from the heroic example. He's drunk more deeply than anyone, perhaps, of the cup of bitterness, but his will becomes our will, and our life is kindled at his own. There's a lot more to it than that, but I think James is really good for describing uh, that kind of inspiration, and I think that that's, that's true. The other piece of it, of course, is that when you look at the fountainhead, and I'm, I'm guessing the, the, you've read a number of times, you've noticed this, when we look at the mental processes of the characters, 
as the book goes along, we actually get less and less of an inner, inward view of Rourke himself. You can look at that because we've gotten to know him, we see him in action, and then we ourselves can understand the principle without our having to follow him into his mind. And instead, we find out a lot about the mental processes, for example, of Gail Wynand. We spend a lot of time with Gail Wynand. Gail Wynand is a tragic figure, and he's powerful too, I wouldn't say as inspiration, but it's a kind of warning. This is what can happen. This is what uh, a potentially heroic soul can do to himself and does. We even see when Rourke and Wynand are talking together, what it means to have those different ideas in dialogue. And speaking of crime and punishment, I could have talked all two hours about crime and punishment, but one of the things that's interesting in crime and punishment is that we do have conversations between Raskolnikov and Porfiry Petrovich, the prosecutor, and to some extent, it's as if they're each other's um, foil. You know, they're talking to each other, and the prosecutor is trying to get Raskolnikov to confess because he doesn't actually have the physical evidence to bring his case against him. But if he can get Raskolnikov to confess by showing that he understands him, then he's won. So part of what you have there is it's his insight into Raskolnikov to get Raskolnikov to explain his thinking because the thinking itself is what incriminates Raskolnikov. The big clue is the article. I mean, it's almost as if, you know, there's a philosophical novel. Raskolnikov wrote an article explaining all of his motivations before he ever picked up an ax. And the prosecutor has read that and so he understands. So it's actually, it's a very interesting novel, you know, philosophically, psychologically. And by the time you get to the end, you realize that uh, Dostoevsky is from my perspective, Ayn Rand's perspective on the wrong side, because he thinks that uh, thinking will corrupt your soul and ruin you versus Ayn Rand thinking and, and correctly that you know, thinking is uh, what saves your life. So I, I certainly recommend that book and I'd be happy to talk about it. I can see why it would have an impact on you. I think when you look at the Fountainhead, you get all the different sides. You get the loser and Peter Keating is definitely the loser. And you probably know that Maslow, Abraham Maslow, he was interested in Peter Keating. He thought that that was a perfect example of a certain kind of weakness. And we get to know Peter Keating pretty well and how his thinking goes awry. We get to know Rorick, we get to know Wynand, and sometimes we get to know Ellsworth Tuohy as well. One of my favorites in what I'm calling the in review is Ellsworth Tuohy, he sees Rorick and he imagines himself falling out of a building and what would happen when he hit the ground. You know, it's as if he, he looks at Rorick and that, that's his opposite. And so that's, that's the, he gets that right away which is interesting, you know, because um, he's pretty smart in the sense that before Rourke has even said anything, he knows that the two of them are, on, are, are uh, opposites of each other. So it's, uh, it's, it is a very good novel from a certain perspective. It's also, I mean, from all perspectives, but especially I think it's interesting that the in view, inward view does not follow Rourke all the way through the book. And that, you know, especially as we're getting into part three, which is Wynan's part, and part four, which is called Howard Rourke, but most of it is not the inward view, inward view, but we know him already by then. And that Ayn Rand, she used to tell herself, don't dialogue thoughts. And she saw that as, as uh, something she didn't want to do in her fiction was to have everything be simply the record of the person's thinking. Don't dialogue thoughts. Okay, so that's sort of what I had to say um, in reaction to yours, and you can certainly talk back to me afterwards. But what I actually had thought of talking about today was to have a few examples of what I think is very interesting in literature in which a writer character, uh, presents a character by means of the character's thinking, okay? And you remember from The Fountainhead that when Rourke talked to Mallory and he said, you know, don't tell me about your feelings or your family, or your childhood, tell me about the thing, tell me about what's most important. Tell me about the things you think. So Ayn Rand tells us about what people think, not in the sense of their conscious convictions, but of letting us watch them as they think. And I've got actually two examples here where they're not doing as well as they could. And as, as but they're good characters, but as readers, we can see how they could do better. And then, okay, let me, um, give you the first one. Uh, the first one is right from the beginning. 
Zeddy Willers, chapter one, part one. And um, because I don't like to approximate on rent, I have to read what she's saying. He enjoyed the sight of a prosperous street. Not more than every fourth one of the stores was out of business, its windows dark and empty. So that's sort of interesting, you know, that only one out of four of the stores are empty. And his conclusion is that this is a good street. Now, of course, that's a positive view and it's relative to other streets. But nonetheless, he's trying to be optimistic and to reach for the positive, which again is something of Eddie. It takes him a while to catch on to things being wrong. Then, he did not know why he suddenly thought of the oak tree. And then we have the flashback about the oak tree and how it was his symbol of strength. And after a storm, the trunk was only an empty, empty shell because the living power had gone, and this was an immense betrayal. Okay, now it says here, and again, this is typical Eddie Willers. He felt anger at himself. There was no reason why he had to remember that oak tree tonight. It meant nothing to him any longer, only a faint tinge of sadness. And somewhere within him, a drop of pain moving briefly and vanishing like a raindrop on the glass of a window, its course in the shape of a question mark. Well, he ought to be asking himself why he's thinking of that oak tree. Okay, he's thinking of that oak tree, and it's not that someone yelled oak tree in the vicinity, it's because he's thinking about what that oak tree meant and what it means for the living power to be gone and for Taggart Transcontinental to be a hollow shell because he's about to walk into the heart of that building to the center of the center of the center, and what's he going to find there? Hollow shell himself, right? James Taggart, from whom the living power had gone. And yet, Eddie doesn't ask himself, why, why am I thinking about that oak tree? And similarly, he's not, he knows what's wrong with James Taggart, but he's not identifying what's wrong with the world in general or with the way that, or with, with what's wrong with this enterprise. So if he asked himself, why am I thinking about that oak tree? Then maybe he might be more prepared to recognize another hollow shell and to do something about it. So that's my first example. And the second one also is a good character. But again, it's someone who, whose train of thought, so to speak, we follow, and who doesn't ask himself what he needs to ask himself. And this is um, part two, chapter two. And this is Reardon at the Taggart wedding. He's being shown off by Lillian as her obedient husband. And then he sees Dagny. Then, as if a single sudden blow to his brain blasted a moment's shift of perspective, he felt an immense astonishment at what he was doing here and why. He lost, for that moment, all the days and dogmas of his past. His concepts, his problems, his pain were wiped out. He knew only, as from a great clear distance, that man exists for the achievement of his desires, and he wondered why he stood here. He wondered who had the right to demand that he waste a single irreplaceable hour of his life when his only desire was to seize the slender figure in gray, Daphne, and hold her through the length of whatever time there was left for him to exist. So he, this is something that's happened to him suddenly. He's focused on an important point, man exists for the achievement of his desires. He asks an important question, what am I doing here? And why can't I do what I want? And then comes the next paragraph. In the next moment, he felt the shudder of recapturing his mind. Now, that's not exactly what's happening here, but it's the way it feels to him. He felt that, that's me, he felt the tight, contemptuous movement of his lips pressed together in token of the words he cried to himself. You made a contract once, now stick to it. And then he thought suddenly that in business transactions, the courts of law did not recognize a contract wherein no valuable consideration had been given by one party to the other. All right, so he's not even... The contract that he's made is his marriage contract. He's got this abstract idea about the contracts are not valid if nothing valuable has been given. And he wondered what made him think of it. Okay? It's as if the thought came to him, but he's not examining it. The thought seemed irrelevant. He did not pursue it. Okay, again, it's sort of as if Hank and Eddie are doing the same thing. You know, that something comes to them and it's based on other things they know, and they put it aside. Well, 
He, d he considers that contracts without values exchange are not valid, but he doesn't know why it occurs to him and he doesn't pursue it. If he did, he would consider that his marriage contract is no contract at all. Lillian is his personal destroyer. He doesn't owe her anything. He'd recognize that that idea he had that it's right to live is if your happiness matters. This ought to count. And then when he's good and ready, he could do something about that. So that's my second example. And my third one, and this will be shorter, but it's because after all, we're here at Ironman Center UK. This one comes from a British writer, Jane Austen. Yay, Jane Austen. Okay, and here we got another character who somehow ignores the clues in her own mind and thus neglects and subverts her own mental process. It's Emma, okay, in the novel by that name. And she's reflecting on her recent meeting with Mrs. Augusta Elton, the clergyman's new bride, a woman of extraordinarily bad uh, judgment and taste and tact. We're in volume two, chapter 14. And Mrs. Elton, the idiot, has said that she was astonished to find Mrs. Weston, who was Emma's governess, former governess, to be quite the gentlewoman and to find Knightley, who was the brother of Emma's brother-in-law, to be quite the gentleman. Emma, meanwhile, thinks that she's involved in a courtship with someone named Frank Churchill. And I don't actually want to spoil the whole story for people who haven't yet read the book, but I'll simply note that Frank is not exactly aptly named. But now I'm going to give you Emma's thoughts. After she's met with Mrs. Elton, you know, who was surprised to find those people gentlemen. And this is Emma. Insufferable woman. Worse than I had supposed. Absolutely insufferable. Nightly, I could not have believed it. Nightly, never seen him in her life before and call him Nightly and discover that he is a gentleman? Actually, to discover that Mr. Nightly is a gentleman? I could not have believed it. And Mrs. Weston, astonished that the person who had brought me up should be a gentlewoman. Worse and worse. Oh, what would Frank Churchill say to her if he were here? How angry and how diverted he would be. Ah, uh, there I am thinking of him directly, always the first person to be thought of. Frank Churchill comes so regularly into my mind. Okay, so these are Emma's thoughts. And you see that she named Knightley, and then she thought of Mrs. Weston, and then she thought of Frank Churchill, and to herself it seems as if, well, there I go again, thinking of Frank Churchill first. But we can read, okay? And we see that, well, is he the first person she thought of? Well, no. First she thought of Mr. Knightley, then she thought of Mrs. Weston, so he's a distinct third. So if you're reading, you see whom she actually thinks of first, and you also see that she herself is, could have paid attention to how her thoughts came to her, but instead she imposed a, you know, an assumption there and thought of that instead. Okay, well, those were all, those were all negative examples in a way. And there are, of course, positive examples, you know, in, in Ayn Rand and, um, and in the works of other writers. But what it all comes down to is whether people, these people are paying attention to the questions that come to their own minds. And that's a step toward then being able to give the right answers and to act accordingly. So those are, those are my examples of uh, the, the inward view. And um, I guess it's your turn or for the Q&A now. That was, I thought that was fantastic and some great, lovely examples there of, as you said, I, well, I noticed that, you, you know, you're implying evasion and what, what happens when we evade or put certain things aside. Is that what you were saying? Well, that's interesting because um, I, I think that evasion is somewhat more active than just not noticing. Or maybe repressive. Is, okay, here's come a, here comes a thought, get away from me. Okay, that's yeah. James Taggart. And boy, yeah. we've got really good examples with James Taggart. Um, and Ayn Rand describes it metaphorically and gives us the thoughts and uh oh, here comes the thought. Let's, let's get away from there, Peter Keating also. So these things, they're not examples of evasion, but they're just not following through. They're, yeah. they're people who are not following through on the clues that come from their own minds that would help them. Often, especially with evasion, people are running away from something that they themselves see as somehow threatening here. They're not afraid of threats. It's simply that they're not, at this point, going all the way and listening to their own minds, paying attention to their own minds and following through. So mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think that it counts. If you want evasion, you know, we got James, James Taggart is 
very good example of, of yeah. that. All, one of them. Oh, and Stadler, Dr. Robert Stadler. He's very good at that. You know, he says he, he doesn't want to say the next sentence that's in his head because he doesn't want to ask the question because he knows he's not going to like the answer. So the two of them are, are especially good at and in a definitely bad way. Sure. So, but not these. Yeah. These are simply people who are not as effective at this point as they ought to be in using the resources that they themselves have. Yeah. I mean, something that I wanted to say, I realized earlier as well, in terms of, of um, fictional characters being resources, being, into, um, being we often talk about with, in terms of resilience. Resilience is the ability to draw upon internal and external resources. And a lot of people will describe the internal resources are characters who have made, you know, profound effects. So if I'm, you know, James Bond will come up a lot of times and, you know, particularly for the younger client, etc. But also something I'm, I, f I forgot to mention is that I also noticed, you know, so I, that people will draw upon characters in terms of what do you, if they, if in real life you're faced with a dilemma, what, what should I do here? People will often draw upon a character because they, and what, what would they think and do in this situation? So what would Howard Rourke do here? But also what would Tui do here? You know, these, these, and, and what would be the consequence of that? And as you said, you know, that can save a huge amount of time in terms of uh, allowing you to see something much more clearly than going through, you know, many ways people going through it themselves. You know, what, what, what would Howard Rourke do here? He, oh, he would definitely do this. Well, but oh, see, here's the thing. What would Howard Rourke do? He wouldn't think about some other literary character and what that character would do, so, yeah. right? So, so in a way, you need to have the independence of Rourke, which means figuring out what an independent person, which is you, would do in the situation. Now, it, it is true that uh, the, the image of a fictional character or the image of an actor can be helpful in picturing what a certain kind of action or speech would be like. I happen to like certain movie stars and I think of them if I have to do something in um, John Wayne, for example. I do not look like John Wayne. I can't ride a horse, I can't shoot a gun, but, um, but he, he often has a certain, he knows what he wants to do. He has uh, skills, he's got moral certainty. And so if I have to do something difficult, sometimes I'll send John Wayne, you know, just sort of as, yeah. you know, well, well, yeah, oh, okay. Yeah. Of course, then I discovered Clint Eastwood. And uh, <laughs> Clint, East, Clint Eastwood could also uh, hand, handle many things well. But you can't actually turn over the reins to someone no. else because... But when, when you're dealing with, with people with such low self-esteem, that and but at least there's that part of them that recognizes the good or the virtuous in someone they can use that as a as a starting point of turning their life around and turn and pointing in a direction that they feel or they think would help them yes and in, well in, i think that um it's one thing literature can do it can give you virtual experience good and bad of of um of uh, actions and kinds of life that you haven't experienced directly Exactly. And so, yeah. especially people who themselves have not had success experiences, it can be, oh, well, this is what it would look like. Yeah. This, this is what it would look like. And even this is what it might look like to the person who was, who was doing it. But mm. you can't just, you know, I mean, and, and you, you, you can't just uh, turn it over to someone else. I don't think that would be good for a person of low self-esteem. Right? No, you know, but you, I think being inspired by great art and, and great characters is definitely something that, you know gives you energy and lifts you and can help get you yes. off the floor in the, in a moment to then use that energy to to rebuild and reconfigure your own life definitely yes um, you see that a lot and you know that it's possible to come you know especially as people begin to this is just from my own observation when people begin to have success experiences they can inspire themselves I did sure. that yesterday. I can do it tomorrow. Yeah. I know how. Absolutely. And there, there's, a, there's a process that um, someone called Barbara Fredrickson came up, which is savoring. And you savor mm -hmm. your past successes as, oh. as a way of giving yourself, again, energy and uh, focus going forward. That's a similar thing. It's like what you're saying. If I've done this before, I can do it again. But also the savoring is actually a technique of going into that experience and, and in a way reliving it and regenerating some of that positive emotion that can take you forward. 
Um, mm-hmm. It's a powerful tool. Powerful tool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we. So maybe it would be good now to maybe get some kind of discussion going with with the people um, in a form of Q and A, etc. People's comments. I'd um, be very interested to hear. For this, you know, we've got quite a few people here. Um, yeah. Razi and, and I noticed that people are a lot shyer. Yeah. On Zoom yeah. than in real life. People on so, Zoom tend to ask fewer questions, but we do have three hands raised now, so uh, hopefully today will be different. Okay. All right. Uh, first question, um, T, you are unmuted. Hi. Uh, thank you for the discussion. I, I must admit, when I found this a meetup, I, I didn't really have an understanding of what a rand was, um, but I, I find the, the discussion very interesting, and I think there's things I can take away from it. Um, actually, from both of your perspectives, I'd be very interested to to hear your perspectives on on Mothering Heights, because I, in in that book, I feel particularly there's a lot of people with different viewpoints who think I know Heathcliff and I can reform Heathcliff, or I can love Heathcliff, I will be the one that will change Heathcliff. And deep down you know, as, as the, the reader, that no one's gonna change Heathcliff. And it was interesting, Josh, that you were talking about people, um, I guess, identifying or getting inspiration from what I would call uh, conventional heroes. Uh, but for t- to me, I, I, when I read Wuthering Heights, I found Heathcliff to be a hero of sorts, because this is a man who was brutal, he was ruthless, and those aren't qualities that I see as in a, in a hero, but he ultimately had conviction in himself and what he wanted to do and where he wanted to be, and he did that. And it was up to other people whether they wanted to be encompassed by that maelstrom. Um, so in the context of what we're discussing, um, Shoshana, I'll be very interested to hear your perspective on, on that particular book, and, and Josh, as I said, in terms of the, the conventional heroes. Okay, what? well, I was very interesting example because of course we've got the multiple narrators right you know we got Nellie we got Lockwood who was something of a filter we had the time frame and then we have the double plot that we we get it once and then we have it again now the interest one interesting thing to me about Heathcliff is that I am most interested in what he was doing when he was out of town and making himself a success and came back because I think that that's a, that's a story of success and redemption. And I would like to know what happened, how he did that. Because when he came back, all of a sudden he's into revenge. Okay, and this is not a good motive. Um, I, I think uh, if he's interested in Kathy, then, and Kathy's interested in him, and I am Heathcliff and so on, then, you know, we got a possibility there. Instead, he goes and marries Isabella, whom he doesn't love has a son whom he's cruel to. And these are not good things, you, you see. And so it's, it's as if um, he's got good qualities, but he's mis, he misuses them. And um, I think that, well, I guess if I were gonna be, uh, he could read Atlas, he could read The Fountainhead and that might do him some good. Um, j- just from the standpoint of, you know, it's, it's your life. How do you wanna spend it? because I don't think he ends up being a happy man. He's a haunted man. You know, he and Kathy, their ghosts are gonna reunite. Fine date is that, you know, I mean, that's, so I, I, I find that disappointing. What I find very powerful in the book is that um, the presentation of the alternatives are so weak and unconvincing. You know, nobody wants to be Edgar Linton. You know, and possibly the next generation, although they seem more to be pale copies, maybe they've got a better chance. But you know, it's it's a book in which uh, you know Emily Bronte has created powerful emotions that've got no place to go. So I guess that's that's sort of uh, what, what I think about the book. I interestingly, you know, I, I teach Jane Eyre. Um, that's one that that you know freedom and uh, you know uh, her own her own choices and taking responsibility and so on and i can see the the pattern in that and with weathering heights i've never taught it because it's i i guess um i think i'd want to fix it you know someone wrote sort of a book about heathcliff and what he was up to when he was out of town but that's that's the part of the story that's interesting and that's the part that um she doesn't tell so that's what that's what I think about Wuthering Heights, but um, it, it's um, it's very powerfully written, and there are people who say there was only one Bronte, you know, and it was Emily, you know, and that uh, that uh, Charlotte doesn't count, Nan doesn't count, and Branwell certainly doesn't count, but that Emily was the writer, and that that's the best written book, and I think it, it the writing's very fine. I think there's a question about uh, the 
the way the story fits together. And since you tell me that you are not familiar with Ayn Rand, I am really glad that as I think about it, I didn't make a certain point I was going to make, which would have been a spoiler. So if you're going to read Atlas Shrugged, don't read anything about it first. Just read it for yourself. Seriously, it's a mystery. You yeah, I, when I when I uh, did my intro, I, I wondered if there's anything I for, I'm forgetting. And yeah, the one thing I was forgetting was uh, to say, if you haven't read Ayn Rand's <laughs> novels, there will be spoilers. Uh, so yeah, maybe. Yeah, well, maybe. I, I didn't actually make my spoiler point, so I'm glad. Well, maybe maybe we'll uh, make sure that that's on the YouTube video so that uh, nobody watches it before they they read Ayn Rand. Um, Josh, did you have anything to add? No, I, I've not read um, Wuthering Heights, um, and the only Bronte book I've read is is Jane Eyre, and actually Jane Eyre did make a a, a big impact on me as a teenager as well. I found it um, very powerful, um, partly because I had also grown up part of my life up in that part of England as well and um, I just found her a fa I found it um, amazing at a young age to see this aristocrat fall in love with this kind of very in many ways plain but strong woman and uh, and, I, and I thought that that had a bit of you know I found that very powerful um, again I only read it when I was about 15 16 She's really terrific. I mean, one of the best scenes comes in the early part of the book when the school teacher is asking her, you know, do you, do you know religion? If you learn about things and what happens to bad girls? And, you know, they, 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 go, they go to hell. And well, what do you think about that, Jane? And she says, I must stay in good health and not die. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Let that be a lesson to us all. I remember finding her very inspiring, you know, as, yes. as, as, and, and also, yeah, a real survivor, and that, and and I and, and I took that with me from that book. I remember that very well. And of course, we got to not spoil it for other people. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So no, yeah, not, <laughs> yeah. Uh, our next question is from Nikos. Yeah, apologies for the shaky image, but my Zoom is very weird. Uh, I also like Withering Heights, and it has one of the most romantic lines. I don't know if it's in the, I, if it's from the book or the movie or in both, but I think at some point Heathcliff says something like. Uh, like uh, in one second, I want you more than this guy's gonna want you in like five years or something like that. Anyway, great line. So I, ha I have a question which is a massive spoiler. So either people who haven't read Atlas Rugged protect your ears, or I'm, I'm gonna try to ask the question in a way that is not spoiler, but anyone who has read the book will understand it. So, so Sana, I always thought that I always struggled with this question that many people ask how realistic are heroes that are in a way so to speak larger than life and specifically when they have these internal dialogues it's very easy to see their path and see how they're actually rational which is a very human thing there's nothing super human in being rational but the thing that i have trouble to understand every time is when it comes to the erotic triangle or actually ero erotic quartet towards the end. So you have, again, I don't want to give spoiler, you have a very special man who wins the hearts of the girl and there are two other very special men who, for whom this woman has been the one and only love in their life, but they're so overwhelmed in respect and love, non-romantic love for this one special guy that they seem to be okay with it. And actually one of them sends her a note and says, I've met the guy, I understand why you fell for him, something like that. Not in these words, but that's the meaning. And my question is, is are we still here in the realm of something that is realistic? So put, let's put it in this term. So let's say I have a love of my life and you know, Razi is a brilliant man, she meets Razi, uh, she falls in love with Razi. So, and then we go vacation all together. We're in the same village, let's say. We hang out together. Is this still within the realm of romantic realism? Okay. Well, I, I actually, the, I can give us something of an answer to that, which actually pertains to the subject of the inward view, which is, you don't know what they're thinking. Okay? You know that they're being very classy in the things that they say and that that is an expression that is you know true and accurate and so on but do you really think that uh you know if someone is experiencing 
deep loss and disappointment that that's going to be a good thing to express? No. <laughs> or, or, or just in, in that, at that time and place, you see what I mean? So, and, and Ayn Rand is not going to make a point of telling us everything about that. Uh, the important thing, you know, that again, contextually in, in the action is that they do understand. And that has to do with how things are. And um, they understand and that they have enough respect for everybody to say that. Okay, I get it. Now, as far as you're saying that they're okay with that, well, that they don't cry in front of everybody doesn't mean that they're not crying on their own. Think about it. You know, you, you don't know, you don't necessarily know everything that everybody is thinking at every moment. But the, as far as it, whether it's realistic that someone would be you know, classy enough to understand it and to make it clear, you know, I don't blame you. I understand. That's helpful. Thanks. I never thought of it this way. Yeah, thanks. Well, I can tell you why people ask that sort of thing. It's because I meant explain so many things that sometimes when you read it, you think, well, why didn't she explain this? Why didn't she explain that? Why didn't she, why wasn't Atlas Shrugged 10 times as long and included there? All the good scenes that are, are not there. <laughs> And you know, she did, the draft is longer than what she kept. And so sometimes she does have more scenes and more thoughts and so on. But I think most people find Atlas Shrugged to be long enough, you know, rather than <laughs> where's the rest of it. Okay, but thanks for the question. Thank you very much. Oh, Nikos, I'll just say something to that. that I, I had a very sort of a similarist response um, and I, and I know I'm alone. I remember I was at a, um, an event that Dr. Andy Bernstein did and that these questions keep coming up. And I remember sort of saying something along the lines of how could anyone not want to be with Francisco forever? You know, he's just, just he is, you know, the joy of life incarnate in literature. Why would you not, you know, and so on. And, and Andy said something either to me or someone else about like, you know, you're really sad for Francisco. And I was like, yeah. And I'm trying not to spoil anything or anything, but, but Andy said, well, don't you think that Francisco is going to find another great woman? There will be another great woman for Francisco and don't worry about it. Something like that, you know, and it, and it, I found that quite, I found that quite amusing in terms of, he the way he dealt with the room in that there were a lot of people that wondering the same thing and and um he's saying that wasn't important well actually if you look at the book there is something that you uh <laughs> there is this woman who's already in atlantis okay and um she has very good taste where men are concerned she's a woman of high achievement and high character she's even a writer so she would appreciate him and she's She's in love with golf, but she's classy about it. And she knows that that's, that's not in her future. And now, of course, I don't think we exactly want Atlas Shrugged to be another 100 pages longer for everybody to, to meet up. But I think that they're, they're a very good match. And uh, that woman, the writer, she looks like Ayn Rand. You, know, you look at the description of her, and she's got the, the, the great big eyes and, and the disheveled the hair. And Ayn Rand used to call her husband, you know, I mean, Francisco is, is, is like Frank. And so that's it. You know, she, she, she named Francisco after Frank and she put a character in the book to be a match for him. But plot wise, I don't think we want the book to go on to draw that out, but you know, she's already there. She's already there. Again, if this were silly, we'd have a sequel, but I don't think we need a sequel to Alice Shrugged to, to have the further adventures of... Uh, I of want that. a sequel. If someone... Uh, and by the way, are you familiar with uh, any good uh, so-called fans fiction which try to do something like a sequel which is presentable and not something like horrible? Well, I guess I, I will say that I never saw anything that I thought I needed to read, you know, other All than right. for curiosity but that doesn't mean it couldn't be. Um, I think Ayn Rand herself would say that this is her world and that she, now for her, the characters went on in her mind. 
she said that when she's writing a book afterwards as if the characters are the house guests and it takes time after the house guests leave before your house gets back to normal but um and they were she thought of them as like people but I don't think she exactly thinks of her characters as going and visiting someone else's house. You know, they're they're her characters. So uh, I think Thanks. That, yeah. Well, before before we have a sequel, maybe we should get the movie part right, or or at least the miniseries. Uh yeah. Lee. I have this little riddle about silly riddle about Atlas and the Fountainhead. If if you trade one character in one book for another character in the other and shorten both books by hundreds of pages what characters get traded because you take one person from the fountainhead put her put that person in atlas take one person from atlas and put it in the fountainhead and the books shorten greatly who are those two people well i don't want to uh, torment you with this i'll just tell you my answer it's uh, dagny and dominique because if you put Dominique into the into Atlas, she joins the strike immediately, and it's all over as far as that's concerned. If you put Domi if you put Dagny into the Fountainhead, she will not torment Rourke for hundreds of pages. She won't do that. So I'm not suggesting you make this trade, but it's sort of interesting. And the point I wanted to ask about is, in Atlas, there are a number of times when Dagny nearly realizes uh, which gets the insight that she needs to join the strike. She comes very close at a few places. I, I actually listed them somewhere, but I, I don't know where that list is. Anyway, there are a number of places where she comes close, but then something happens to Taggart Trans Transcontinental, you know, some big disaster, and she immediately shifts gears and goes, uh, goes and solves the problem and forgets about what she was about to think about. And so my question is, uh, how do you analyze this? Is this a case of where, where your, your positive values can actually stop you from thinking about something that you should think about? Is that a possibility or is that just too outrageously heretical and nonsensical? But that's on the face of it, that's what it looks like, that her positive values, uh, namely Tiger Transcontinental, and the pursuit of those values actually stops her or at least slows her down greatly. Whereas Dominique, who has who is motivated negatively, doesn't have the positive values, would would uh, analyze the situation correctly immediately. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Something to think about. Whichever one wants to tackle that first. Well, I've had I've had it before, so let's let Josh do it. Josh. Well, my my initial response when you were talking about it, Lee, was exactly what you were saying that 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 Taggart Continental is of such high value to Dagny that she was protecting it almost like a, um, a mother and their child in that way. Um, and that was my initial response, but it's definitely something I, I, I'm, I'm not coming to a, like, I, I have to think about this for a while. I think it's a, 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 an interesting question and that, that I, I need to, I need to reread Atlas Shrugged again, actually. That's, I think that's going to be this year's reread. I wrote, reread the band's head last year. So I'm not so up with, um, it, maybe even those junctures that you said where she very nearly got it and then was driven, you know, to protect her, her baby again. Yeah. So well, I, even aside from that, she, uh, um, it takes her a long time Yeah. To, to arrive at the conclusion, which I think a Dominique would arrive at almost instantly. Or not instantly. Dominique was Ayn Rand in a bad mood, right? So, so she would have got it straight away. Go, that's my little cheat there <laughs> um, while I while I think about it. Yeah, Dagny is Ayn Rand with all possible flaws removed. Okay. Okay. Now, yeah. I, here, here's the thing about uh, Dagny and not uh, getting back to work and Reardon the same thing. He's almost glimpsing it and then it's back to work. What we have in the book is that for all the characters um, having, you know, accomplishing something having productive work, getting something done is a, is a positive value. And in a proper world, it would be positive. The learning has to, for Reardon, is realizing that um, he's working in the service of his destroyers. Dagny's running trains for people who are you know, 
the John Galt line makes her life harder. Reardon Metal makes Reardon's job harder. It's because of these particular circumstances. And ordinarily, you do something good, it's good. And I, I think what's, what's sort of irresistible as far as uh, seeing how this thing works with Dagny and with Reardon is when you see Francisco uh, saving the furnace, he's not supposed to do that. You, you know, I mean, basically, uh, uh, now people saving each other's lives is one thing, but here he's actually, that's why he stops talking to Reardon at that point about trying to explain things to him. He says, I understand how it is that you can go on bearing these burdens because he's just done it himself. You know, he's, he's jumped right in. So um, it's a certain kind of error, but it's also one that you'd need to understand a lot more in order to figure out the whole thing in order to avoid that. I mean, we could keep going. We could talk about Eddie Willers, Eddie Willers, secret agent, right? Eddie Willers, who finds a friend in the cafeteria and he spills the beans to him every day, making all kinds of trouble for a tag at Transcontinental. Now, it's good that he finds a friend and we know who that is. And it's good that he wants to share thoughts with this person, but in total context, and he could even be thinking, who is this guy? Why is he so interested? Doesn't even get to know his name. So I think that sometimes certain kinds of incomplete, considering all the facts and all the consequences, can lead to trouble. I'm wondering, Lee, Lee, I'm wondering what your answer to that is. I don't know for sure. I, I, offhand, I think that it is possible that your your values actually your, your proper, proper values actually can mislead you in certain circumstances when they are not contextually appropriate i mean i guess her her values are proper but they're not proper in the wider context of things i mean her 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 love and her her desire to keep tagger transcendental going is a a value but not in the full context of the situation now, on the other hand, we are not supposed to think, I don't believe, that Dagny is evas evading in any sense. That, you know, she's fully moral uh, in what she's doing, but she is mistaken. There is a mistake there, and I guess, it, I guess we'd say that it's the mistake that's causing the problem, but it's an honest mistake. And it's driven, the mistake is driven by her value, her, her uh, tremendous, you know, top, values of, of uh, Taggart, Tronsky, and Little. Um, all right, before we go to Peter, uh, Betty asks in the chat, what is uh, the difference between a fictional hero and a real hero? Well, I, I, I mean, other than the obvious, that uh, a, a fictional hero uh, is not, you know, living historically at a particular time, and the event and the, the actions the character takes are not real. I think uh, maybe the, the deeper question there is um, the difference between uh, art and history. And of course, history has significance and themes and plots and so on, but it also has noise. And in good art, the noise is at a minimum. You know, in real life, you go around a lot of corners and there's nothing there. In, Fiction, there's something meaningful and interesting and important on the other side of the corner. So when you have a fictional hero, you have a hero with the noise removed. And um, Alfred Hitchcock used to, you know, I remember Alfred Hitchcock. Um, he used to say that other writers give you um, a slice of life. I make it a slice of cake. And, um, you know, you don't find cake growing on trees. Cake, cake is made. So I, I think that's... That's what I would say. What do you What do you think, Josh? Well, I was I was going to say echo exactly that 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 a fictional hero is refined as well. Like we we see, we see the essential parts in 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 um, of their existence in life and how that drives a story. Um, you know, when we read the Fountainhead, we don't see the times when Rourke makes a mistake and rubs his pencil. You know, rub gets the eraser out and rubs the lines off and throw something in the bin and all those sorts of things because they're not essential to the story. You do see it. There's a wastebasket with, with stuff in well, it. Well, okay, then maybe that was not... That's where the trash goes. Yeah. No, no, because but, he doesn't have to be infallible Yeah, get and we, it the first time. It's exactly what you're saying just now. But the, So the real hero, the, the slog is there always. is the, As you say, all the noise is there. Mm -hmm. In good fiction, you don't see the sort of 
the trudge, the, the mundane that is also a, a part of it. And that's, that's sort of one of the big differences, I think. But I think it actually is significant that he doesn't get everything right the first time, but he's got something to learn yeah. from Kim. But I'm right? just, I, I wasn't really talking about mistakes. I was even just thinking about just like, we don't see everything because it's not important to the story. Yes. Yeah. That's true. And uh, maybe, maybe, maybe we could say that, that the fictional hero serves the story, the plot, the theme of the novel. The real hero, the, their life is the, is the plot, is, is, is the story, and that's different. Right. Well, I'm sure you know this. You know, Ian Forster, British writer, um, used, to, used to talk about the difference between a, a, a plot and a, a simple uh, sequential narrative. Uh, the king died and the queen died is just, you know, sequence of events. The king died and the queen died of grief. You've put some causality in there. And um, there's a connection between things. It's not just an accident. And I, I think on a bigger scale, that's what art is, is that it's not an accident. It's not one damn thing after another, but there is, it's built. And mm -hmm. the characterizations are like that too. Yeah, for, for, for example, in the real hero, Steve Jobs, that I'm reading about right now, he, he uh, we all know he dies prematurely in his life and, and the, the story suddenly is just done but in the, in the the, the 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 fictional hero we would see something more complete there as well uh, peter i have a a related question which is i know people who refuse to read fiction they just want real stuff they only read biographies and history and Josh, since you're kind of straddling that line of yeah. used to read fiction and now now you read nonfiction, what is the motivation for that approach, that attitude in, in some way? I've, I've, so I'll just talk for myself. My time that I have to read is quite limited. And currently, nearly everything that I read is um, in service of my work at the moment. And that's how I, I'm sort of justifying it at the moment. That, and also, you know, I was at Ocon last year and it was interesting to see what people's, who's people's sort of primary, and this has come up a lot in discussion as well, their primary source of art that they enjoy or, you know, use. To, and, and music is my number one. And it always has been. So I'll often, to get that real inspirational lift, I'll often go to music first. And so that's me. So, so, the, so the, the, the purpose of me reading nonfiction is very different to the purpose of reading fiction. And I find that given the way I work and the amount of time I have, I will, I will use my limited time usually to listen to music above fiction. It's not to say that I, I when I do, it's a bit like when I do yoga. When I do yoga, every time I do yoga, I'm like, why aren't I doing this more? my body loves it. It feels great. And then I don't, and then I have that conversation all the time. And there's an element of that with, um, with novels. When I read a good novel, I, I, I just kind of regret not doing it more. So there's an element there. Um, and also I'm a bit like this with, um, with, uh, TV and films. I, I, so there's part of me. I, I personally, I don't like fantasy. I don't like um, anything that's sort of, I love romantic realism, but I don't like anything that's, that, that's kind of, I don't really like science fiction, anything like that, that's sort of out the realms of reality. And maybe that's something I need to look at, but that's, uh, that's where I'm at with it right now. Um, and I'd like to hear what you have to say about that, Shoshana. Okay, well, you know, I, it's a little hard for me to know why people don't like things. Yeah. You know, you have to ask them. Um, and it, it, it could have something to do with not having had a top experience with it. Um, it could have to do with certain kinds of experiences require attention and time that they don't have at that point. But, well, I never had a problem. Um, I mean, I was always interested in, in, um, in reading fiction. And um, I mean, I read some fiction when I was too young to actually understand what it was about. Uh, I mean, I read, I read Jane Austen when I was about nine years old, and I didn't understand that Jane Austen's world was not the world I was living in, in the United States in the 20th century. And I was very worried about the family estate and what was gonna happen if I didn't get married to the right person. <laughs> you know? And I, I thought that's, 
I was a little concerned that no one had explained to me about what the, what the Jane Austen's um, world system, and I was very relieved. I've been glad ever since that I wasn't living in Jane Austen's actual world, but my point, I guess, is that I was getting something from it, even though I did not really understand it as a, from a particular point in time, but I could, follow the, I could follow the story, I could follow the characters, and I was in Jane Austen's world very interested in exactly that issue of how the characters understand or fail to understand um, other, their own experiences, their own desires, and other people. And that was interesting to me. And there they all were laid out for me to, to look at. And that was interesting. And in real life, uh, you don't always get to see people laid out for you clearly answering, um, well, and in, and in literature, you've got a sufficiency of information. And of course, in real life, maybe you can get more, you can ask, but you know, if the writer has done a good job, then it's all, it's there. You just need to read carefully. And um, it's own world. You know? And that, that was interesting. That was always interesting to me. So as far as my students, if they're in my class and they say they don't like to read fiction, I try to find out what they do like and send them away. <laughs> because in my class, they're going to have to read fiction. And I might not be able to make them want to do it in a week or two, which is you know, what I have to get things started with. So what I, what I would ordinarily do if I've got a student, I ask them at the beginning of the term to do a survey. What's your favorite book? I don't have a favorite book. You know a favorite book? And sometimes it turns out they haven't actually read any fiction that was not assigned to them in school. So I say, okay, well, what, what did you like of the things that were assigned to you in school and why? And then I get to know them a little bit and maybe I can suggest other things. And why did you like that? And why was that interesting? Um, I think that in your case, you know, you mentioned you like crime and punishment and that certainly is, um, <laughs> that's starting at the deep end. You know, that's a, that's a, that's a real novel novel. And uh, it's so well done. I, I mean, just the way that he, he works the, the ideas and the characterization and the suspense. The whole thing takes place in just a few days, except for the epilogue. And, you know, and uh, Raskolnikov trying both to find out himself why he did what he did and to not let anyone else know why he did what he did. And two and three different kinds of people trying to find out the truth, right? Svidrigalov, Porfiry Petrovich, and Sonia. You know, so it's it's very exciting. I mean, if you're in, if you think the question of why done it, you know, why did he do it, that's interesting. And in real life, you probably wouldn't get to have that experience. Well, I, I hope you wouldn't be hanging out with a killer in order to get to know his psychology. But well, in in a novel, you can see Dostoevsky's insight and drama about what someone like that might have been. So I, I think I, I like that. I, I mean, I, I teach that one. I teach that one, I guess, every few years it comes up. And I think it's a very good novel, uh, just from the standpoint of the intensity and the scope and the integration of the plot with the theme. So, but I guess if someone said, I don't like fiction at all, I might not just say, oh, you got to read Crime and Punishment. We'd probably start out with something shorter. But um, I, I, I think that's... I think that's a book that if people get a hundred pages into it, they'd probably want to keep going. You know, I guess the trick is to get them a hundred pages into it. So we have a comment and a question. I'll, I'll read them both and you guys can um, answer uh, either or both, uh, whichever you choose. So uh, Bob says, Dagny's error was a lot like Ayn Rand's error, giving too much of the benefit of uh, the doubt to others in some contexts. Uh, and Harry asks, do you have any thoughts about how Rourke navigates grief in The Fountainhead, the scene waiting for the phone to ring comes to mind? It seems he deals with his negative emotions patiently. Could you expand on this if possible? Thanks. Okay. All right. Let's see. Well, the first one was about Dagny and Ayn Rand and their mistakes. Now, what Ayn Rand herself said about Dagny's mistake was that she has the mistake of thinking she can do everything all by herself. And that her ability and her talent and her drive, she can save the railroad and she can save the world and that one person can't do that. I don't think that Ayn Rand actually had 
an overestimation of what she herself could do because she was thinking in terms of what she could create and the impact would come afterwards. I think, in fact, she was disappointed that uh, with the re response to Atlas Shrugged because it was stupid. And in that case, she was expecting people to be able to understand that book better than they did, or better than the reviewers did. And she didn't give them the benefit of the doubt. She was disgusted. OK, I, I think that um, it is true that in, um, she was patient in the sense of not wanting to attribute to people bad motives if she weren't sure. But with Dagny, well, see, the people Dagny's got to deal with, she knows what they are. I mean, she's, she's had experience in dealing with her brother. She does not give him the benefit of any doubt. Um, she doesn't think he's quite as evil as he is. And in the novel, she, we're told there's this point where it says she knew. And that was, that's when she discovers that they actually are moved by the morality of death. It's near the end. But for most of the part, she, she knows what she's dealing with. It's just that the reason she stays on the job is that she thinks she's going to win all by herself or practically by herself. And that's not true. Now, the other question is about, well, maybe Josh would like to deal with that one and then we can get to, to uh, Rourke. So Josh, did you want to think about um, Ayn Rand and Diagne and the mistake? Again, I think you've answered that um, really thoroughly. Um, the thing that came to mind, and I don't know whether this is, true or not is was was Ayn Rand more like that as Bob's saying in the chat when she was younger and as she got older she 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 knew herself better in that way as she was more experienced in life I don't know because I do remember reading a letter it's just come back to me where she wrote to Isabel Patterson I think it was and she she was thought I truly think that we're going to have this massive revolution in the world and everyone's going to get this new philosophy, et cetera. And then um, she'd be naive like that. Um, that's a matter of the time frame. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. There's a time frame to this. Sure. Well, actually, Ayn Rand herself said that the time frame in Atlas Shrugged was not realistic. One gen, you know, 10 years, not realistic. Yeah. But it would take longer than that. And in her early ideas for playing the book, she thought of it as generations. And then she said, no. <laughs> You know, let's let's uh, let's telescope. But the important thing is not how long it takes, but what the causation is. As far as I think it is true that Ayn Rand um, said that when she was younger, she sometimes did see potential in people that they ended up not realizing, and that later on, when she started seeing red flags, uh oh, here we go again, that sort of thing. But I don't know if that exactly describes Dagny. Um, the, the statement we have from Dagny is that when she goes uh, to her first party and you know the, her, when her coming out party, you know, and she's, and she's expecting it to be wonderful and romantic and then afterwards she's disappointed. And did they expect that the lights and the flowers were gonna make them more wonderful and happy and there wasn't a man there I couldn't squash 10 of. So there is a sense that she had an expectation of something that was going to come from that evening that wasn't going to come from that evening. And that's Dagny. And I think uh, with, with Ayn Rand, well, she ended up wanting, you know, focusing on certain things that she wanted in life that had to do with what was within her control. As she said when she was writing out the shrugged, if a bomb went off in the room next door, she wouldn't pay attention. She'd have to keep going. I hope that wouldn't quite be true. Clearly, but um, but just that you know she was she was not going to be stopped, and um, that that reminds me of Dagny. You know, this is what I'm going to do. I'm not going to be stopped. Now the other question had to do with Rourke and how he coped with disappointment, and that's where we're looking at um, the early part of the book. And if you notice that in the novel, before the scene of the party of the Enright House in that whole kind of first third of the book, we do have sequences in which Rourke is walking the streets of the city and feeling threatened and feeling, you know, who was his enemy? Maybe it was every man he passed in the street. And this is the sense of, well, he's got his ability and when is it gonna find, he needs, he can't just sit by himself and build a building. 
he needs you know someone to hire him to build a building and then to put it up and there was a stage where that hadn't happened and that that was was it ever going to happen but i think after the enright house he never gets back it never goes back to that i'm just saying you know that um and, and of course that wasn't that wasn't his first building but it is true that after that he was not going to have to go to back to any quarry. What do you think about you know Rorick and coping with? As far as I'm not having enough money for the electric bill, oh well, you know that's that's how it is. I hocked my watch. Oh well, you know. I think you see in that book, uh, um, Rourke matures, you know, with his, with his experience and and um, and so when you say he deals with his neck in the chat, it says it seems he deals with his negative emotions patiently. I think he does more and more so that, um, and you you see that over the whole novel, you see you see him become this fantastic potential to this actuality over the whole you know this this really truly great man over over no. over the pages, and he he is always a great man, but you see the greatness and what he achieves in more concrete form throughout, and I think. His, you know, his, his ability grows and his yeah. understanding of the issues grows. Absolutely. Yeah, and, you know, he, he, you see him quite rightly be the pupil to Cameron. And then you see him over the book become even greater than Cameron. Yes. And, and I think you see that in his psychology as well. You know, he, to be as strong as he was, to have a friendship with Gail Wynand, and to be in love with Dominique and everything that goes on there. When he has strong negative emotions, he does know what to do about them. Uh, I mean, one of my favorite little scenes is when he's going to Stephen Mallory to ask him to do the sculpture and he sees that baby plaque, you know, that cute, cutesy little kitschy baby plaque and he just smashes that thing. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, I, 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 I always sort of like that because I thought, okay, now what's, what's he going to do when someone messes up one of his buildings? Well, and, and eventually we, we find out. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Now, he, now he, he doesn't do it to, to the Stoddard Temple, but, but that one he got built properly first. So at least it, it existed once in its proper form. But uh, with, with Cortland, you know, I mean, he doesn't actually you know, throw it like the baby plaque, but um, there's there's a parallel there. And, um, and it's not that everything just passes over him. One of the things that you really get from that is he really goes through the emotional ringer rock mm -hmm. and you, you see how he deals with it. And it, it, it's, it's uh, almost heartbreaking at times. And, and that's part of the journey of it. And, and that heartbreak is, shows how strong he is, but also how, how he, you know, as you said, patient in the chat, patiently he was. He was patient. He was t totally honest at all times, and 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 you see how that long term integrity allows him to win in the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's uh, I, I find that incredibly inspirational. And I I I like Zilli and others is unbelievably inspired by the boy on the bicycle scene, yeah. and also the. The, I remember reading that book and always wanting to know, and I'm not going to spoil exactly what happens, but the seminal scene when he does actually meet Tui. And when I was reading the book, I had been making up in my mind mm -hmm. what he might say to Tui, and nothing could have prepared me for what he actually did say. It was yeah. so much cooler than anything I could possibly think of myself. Well, you know, Iron Man did write a, a dialogue scene for them, uh, but she was placed later in the book, and then she took it out. Yeah, and didn't didn't um, Frank? Apparently, Frank inspired. That's the, what he actually actually put in the book. I heard oh, yes. somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. But um, but the the dialogue scene, you know, basically was uh, Tui spilling the beans and ex explaining his motivations and so on. And uh, he wants. It's almost a stay of skin, right? He he wants yeah. to, to to bring it out, and uh, Rourke doesn't argue with him. He just you know hears it. And lets him say it. And then I think that she cut a lot of the book after she finished writing the whole thing because, you know, it's, it's the war, it's paper rationing, and it's also, it's a very long book already, but she said she needed to write the whole book and then decide what to cut. And that was one of the things that came out mm. was the, 
longer conversation between Tui and Rourke. Yeah, it was, yeah. I would like to. I would. I would have been. I would. I in my head wanted to see how that riffing would have gone. But oh well, I think Harry Binswanger put it in. I think either he put it in the Objectivist Forum or it's in the early Ayn Rand. But okay. I think I think I've seen it. I think I've uh, seen it. Raz, Raz is showing it, showing what. Yeah. Okay. It's I'll in there. Dig that out. I mean, it's published. Yeah. Me. Okay. Thanks. Um, I wanted to make a point supporting what Bob what Bob said earlier about uh, Dagny and what's going on with Dagny. Now it's not my point. Uh, but I can't remember exactly where I read it or saw it. But anyway, the point is that through most of the novel, most of Atlas Shrugged, although da just as Shoshana said, D Dagny knows the, the nature, she knows the bad guys are bad. She knows much about their, the problems that the bad guys exhibit and what's wrong with them, but she doesn't really realize, she, she still thinks that they want to live. That they are desirous of living. And so I suppose she, she thinks that she can appeal to that and, and work with that. At some point in the novel, she realizes that these people are not on the premise of living. They want to die. They're, they're, on, they're on the premise of death. And when she real, Shoshana is going to expand on this in a moment. When she realizes that, then it's all over at that point. So that may be what, maybe the, Bob had that in mind. I don't know. Well, that was what I, I mentioned before. This paragraph that starts, she knew. Okay, paragraph starts, she knew. And it's over here on 1135, all right? She knew. And this is when they're planning to torture Galt and they know no good is gonna come of this. She knew what they intended doing and what it was within them that made it possible. They did not think that this would succeed. They did not think that Galt would give in. They did not want him to give in. They did not think that anything could save them now. They did not want to be saved. Moved by the panic of their nameless emotions, they'd fought against reality all their lives, and now they'd reached a moment when at last they felt at home. They did not have to know why they felt it, they who had chosen never to know what they felt. They merely experienced a sense of recognition since this was what they'd been seeking. This was the kind of reality that had been implied in all their feelings, their actions, their desires, their choices, their dreams. This was the nature and the method of the rebellion against existence and of the undefined quest for an unnamed nirvana. They did not want to live. They wanted him to die. Now, of course, Galt talked about this in the speech, about the morality of death, but this is her seeing it in action right now. And of course, it's what kills, you know, what destroys James Taggart um, a little later, right? And when he realizes that I just, you know, he hasn't even screamed yet. I don't care. Okay, Wesley says, we can't afford to kill him. You know it. And then Tagra says, I don't care. I want to break him. I want to hear him scream. I want. And then it was Taggart who screamed as if it's some sight. Though his eyes were staring at space and seemed blankly sightless. The sight he was confronting was within him. And I'm skipping a little. The moment when he knew that he wanted Galt to die knowing fully that his own death would follow. And then she's got a whole paragraph explaining it. And he sees that this is the principle of his whole life. And he says, no, no, no. And Galt says, yes, I told you that on the radio, didn't I? So it all ties together. Okay, and that, that was what Dagny knew. You know, and it apparently took her a while to know it, but that, that, that was what she knew. They don't want to live. And actually, as you're pointing out, I think um, it's something that comes up earlier in the book they must want to live, don't they? Do they? That's sort of a question that's been a, a theme running through it. And at this moment, that's when, well, she's out because uh, she, she understands it. And from a personal angle, Galt is at stake. And so it's really clear. It's really clear um, that um, there's no possible explanation or excuse for what she sees they're planning to do. She just has to do what she needs to do. So yeah, that's that's a good passage. That's the turn. Uh, Josh, I, I'm just loving in listening to trying to go into this much detail. I don't have that that level of uh, oh, detail well, in books. But I, I, have the book. I, I have the book. Yeah, no, but just but in in uh, I'm just loving, I'm yeah. loving that anyway. So I'm just enjoying being a a, a passenger at times yeah. in this. 
there are worse things than having Iron Man write your best lines for you. I yeah, mean, yeah. That's, that's kind of what I do. I, you know, I teach literature, but uh, by I've, trying to the writer speak. I've got a question for you, Shoshana, and it's, it's about Tui and, and, and Ayn Rand's evolution as a writer. And I can't remember, it might have been in one of Euron's podcasts that I listened to. But I think he was saying that Tui would never have been in Atlas Shrugged because he, in many ways, and I've had this discussion with you, he's this brilliant character, but he's, it gives evil too much power and too much, um, that he's in many ways the, oh, the least realistic, that evil isn't actually like Tui is and, and that as, as Rand evolved as a writer in, the, and, in her philosophy and, her, and how she saw the world, that Tui is the one, the, the character that's kind of slightly left behind compared to, to others in, in terms of the nature of, of evil, etc. And no, I was wondering whether I you think, agree with that or... Well, I think there's a point to there not being a place for Tui in Atlas Shrugged. Okay. I mean... Because, it, uh, um, we, we, we don't... Uh, I, I think that Tui is actually... All three of them, you know, there's, there's Peter Keating and there's Tui and there's Wine and and each of them is an, is an enemy for Howard Rourke in a different way. Yeah. And so um, I, I think it's kind of cool that we have uh, Tui in the middle because uh, first you meet Peter and you think, oh, is this one of those stupid books about the two young men who grew up together and took different paths and so on? And I've seen that book, you know, many times. And then of course you, you realize that in fact, they're not equally matched at all. And that um, it's an interesting contrast because at the end of, of, um, of we have um, uh, Peter Keating is rising and succeeding and Rourke is headed off to the quarry, you know? And, um, and, then, it, and then it even gets worse, uh, you know, that uh, Peter Keating is, made a, is making a success with designs he takes from Rourke and he's even got the woman Rourke loves. So Peter Keating looks as if he's sort of like the opponent, except that we know that can't be because he's so weak. So then we meet Tui, and we think, okay, um, he's got greater scale to him, and he's got a bigger ambition, and he looks as if he could be an enemy too, and maybe he's got more power, and he does represent the opposite principle. He represents the opposite principle of Rourke more so than Peter does, because Peter, Peter gets even his second-handedness secondhand from his mother, <laughs> right? Okay, but, but, but Tui, it's as if he's developed... What, what he's developed in some ways independently, but uh, corruptly. And so he looks as if he could be, you know, an opposite. Now, in Atlas Shrugged, we don't have anybody who's an opposite like that to the positive figures. They're all small, okay? Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, and Stather, of course, is brilliant, but we, from the first time we meet him, we know that he's a man who's afraid you know, and he's cowed. So we don't have anybody like that in Atlas Shrugged. We've got the whole world, of, you know, with, uh, full of bad people, but we don't have one person who stands for the opposite principle. Like the, the Stearns folks, they're not, they don't have the same role within Atlas Shrugged that Tui does in The Fountainhead. So I think he's really an important character in The Fountainhead because you meet him, he's got ideas, and he's got ideas that he's explicit about more so than Rourke does. He's got more to say. And you know that he's the opposite of Rourke, but we hear more from him than we do from Rourke in that early part of the book. Rourke doesn't find his voice until part four. That's where he really, in talking with Wynand, he's finally identifying explicitly principles and speaking them and not just living, not just, not just living them. Now, and then you've got Wine, and of course he's an interesting case because he's like Rourke, but he took a different path. And there, that's a matter of seeing, can he learn his lesson and does the world side with him or with Rourke? And that's, and we get the answer to that in the fourth part. So it's kind of as if there's a place for Tui in the Fountainhead. And it is true that it, um, he's so insightful and yet he lives this, uh, about the very, ideas that he's pr promoting and he doesn't want to be happy. He says that, you know, that's not his destiny. Is that credible? But he has a really important role in the novel because you want to 
think about the opposite of Rourke. He's the one that you need to think about. What, what counts for power with him? Because Wynand, he also has got an idea of power, but Wynand is at least potentially Rourke-like and Tui never. Tui never. Tui's all destructive. So I guess I'm thinking of, you know, as Ayn Rand is planning the book, she's not thinking of, well, let's see, are these real people? Well, these are people as if motivated by certain values and ideas, and I want to show these in my novel. And you, I'm sure you've heard this. Someone once said to her, you know, the, the kinds of things that happen in the fountainhead, they couldn't happen. And my friend says so, and, and, and I ran and said, well, tell him for me that it happened in the fountainhead. <laughs> you know, that's, uh, it happened in the fountainhead. And I think that's the way it was for her. I mean, she understood the fountainhead was not um, the same thing as real life, but uh, in certain ways it was realer than real life. And in yep. fountainhead, uh, Tui's got a role to play. And he's very interesting. I mean, he's also... He's got a powerful function, not just in relation to Rourke, but in the, in the destruction of Katie. That's tragic. Yeah. Um, and when you were talking about people, you, you know, um, unhappy people you've met, I thought you were going to be talking about Katie. And you might have met people like Katie who, you know, I'm so miserable. I'm doing all this good work. You know, that person you described, I'm doing all this good work. And, and why am I not happy? I would say that's, that's the, the person, the client I meet the most. Yeah. So it, at the, outside of the specialized sort of addiction PTSD world that I work in. But in just sort of general malaise, that's what I come across all the time. And, it, it, and it's very hard to work with that because I'm not a philosopher and I can't just say here, read this, come mm -hmm. back to me in six months time. You know, but um, yeah, it's a lot of people are like, Hey, I'm doing this. I'm doing everything that's been asked of me and I'm miserable. Right. And remember what, remember what Tui says, which I'm sure is not what you say. He says, and why do you care about how you feel? Who cares yeah. about you? Who made you important? Mm. You're thinking too much. Stop thinking. Yeah. No, he's yeah. terrible. And uh, this is of course exactly the wrong advice to give her. And she laps it right up. But in my, in my case, I have the fortunate position of being able to say, you're here right now. There's enough of you that wants to get well. There's enough of you that is taking that risk of being here. That's and a that, good, yeah, that and, someone made a step in that direction. Yeah. And then, and then we very basic, you know, on a, on a very basic level, we do, we, we do a very thorough values hierarchy. And it always that's always the first real massive step of making that kind of change in, in that context. Because you always find that they're always living someone else's values hierarchy. Mm. They'll always go, well, actually, I never wanted to be a lawyer. I never, only my dad wanted me to be, or I've only really done this because my teacher said I must do it, etc." And you say, what do you really like doing? And then that's the starting point of, of the change. Hmm. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a rough old journey, but it, 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 some of them get there. Well, Katie wanted to go to college, hmm. and he discouraged that. And then he's got her set up in this work that involves being happy when other people need her, and they are not doing as well. You know, it's, it's basically, what is it that his aunt used to say about him? You're a maggot, you feed on sores. And he says, then I'll never starve. And here's Katie. That's what she's doing. She's feeding on sores. Yeah. yeah so he's, he's bad. Um, and you sort of see that he's bad for all those students he was advising when he was the advisor for college students. He's, he's the dream killer. So he's in a certain way, the, um, he's not what people mean when they say anti-hero, but he's sort of the contra hero. You know, he's, he's the one who's against heroism all, all the way. And there's a role for that in the Fountainhead. You know, I mean, that, that's, that, that fits with um, individualism versus collectivism in the human soul. There's a place for that, for, for Tui as the representative of that. So I, I think he belongs in the phone head. Mm. Anything from you, Rossi? Well, I, uh, I checked and unfortunately, um, the dialogue uh, between Howard Rourke and Tui isn't in the early Ayn Rand. Um, there's a, the scenes with Vesta Dunning and there's, 
um, something with Rourke and Cameron. Uh, but Shoshana, you mentioned it might be in the Objectivist Forum, so. And I think also I might have quoted from it in an article I wrote called The Road to, well, it was a talk, and then it was an, it was an essay in Essays on Iron Man's The Fountainhead. I'm pretty sure that I didn't keep that to myself, you know, and I put, put something out there about that. Because I thought it was cool, you know. So it is available. Uh, you can find it if you, uh, if you want to. And uh, I want to thank both our speakers. Uh, this was fantastic. I, uh, I'm, I'm sure everybody here enjoyed it. And hopefully the, uh, we'll have a, a, a good audience on YouTube enjoying it as well. Um, we will be back on Monday and on Wednesday. Uh, you can sign up on Meetup. Uh, and on Wednesday, you can always also uh, join in person. There's a limited number uh, of, of um, seats here available. And you do have to be a member of the Ayn Rand Center UK uh, because this does cost us money. Uh, and then on Saturday, we will be uh, back with Josh. Um, also, yeah, if you enjoyed uh, this event or any other event and you want to see it again or you want to share it with anybody else, it'll be uh, within a few days uh, on our YouTube channel and on our new podcast on all the podcast platforms, including Spotify uh, and Apple Podcasts. So, yeah, I want to thank you both again. And thanks, everybody, for joining us. And uh, we'll see you soon. Okay. And thanks to people for the questions. And thanks to Josh. And thanks to you. Thanks, thanks to everyone. Appreciate you all being here.